Welcome classic rock fans to one of my listening videos, 10 of the best, and today we're going to be looking at kraut rock. The late 60s was a politically turbulent time, there's no doubt about that. You had Paris torn apart by the riots, uh, Britain was very much trying to work out uh, its own identity post-empire. Of course Germany was going through what can only be described as a, an existential crisis. On the one hand you had a generation living in denial, and on the other hand you had a generation that wanted to put as much space between itself and the tenets of National Socialism as was humanly possible. There was a desire to transcend Germany's past. And these new bands emerged influenced by the psychedelic movement in the USA. And this new music, Cosmish music, or Cosmic music if you will, to give it its proper title, was dubbed Krautrock by the British music press. But this music, this cosmish music, was seen as a, an alternative to the lightweight and inoffensive pop known as Schlager that was uh, presented to the German people as good and wholesome fare. These bands came from all over Germany, many of them were not even aware of each other's existence. One commentator said that they represent a moment in time rather than a movement. But my word, it was a moment that uh, influenced Bowie, the Stooges, Brian Eno, not to mention uh, a whole spate of uh, 1980s synth bands that owe a debt to Kraftwerk, as do Radiohead and Joy Division, the list goes on. But where should we start if we want to explore this moment, to explore this remarkable catalogue of bands? Before we do start, I would like to urge you to please click like, subscribe and check that bell to get notified of any future uploads. And do take a moment to check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the sterling work down here at Classic Album Review. Become a Patreon. My word, there's a fine body of work on my Patreon now. Uh, you can make a donation, check out the Amazon wish list, or simply like the Facebook page. It's all good stuff and it's all appreciated. Anyway, with no further ado, Minor Diamond and Heron, welcome to the 10 best crowd rock albums. Number 10 is Faust 4 from 1973. This is a bizarre record, yet profoundly beautiful as well. It's experimental, yet there are some intriguing melodic passages uh, to hold our interest. This band were formed uh, either in or near Hamburg and one can sense all that northern starch being washed away in one fell swoop. They were actually signed by the Polydor label. Now if I'm not mistaken I believe Polydor is also a German label. The opening track of this album Krautrock which is an obvious dig at the British music press is now an explore certain psychedelic tropes and tones from feedback to distortion. Also, it's a very strange sort of offbeat, which gives us a disorientating effect, almost comparable to the use of half rhyme in poetry, perhaps. And the album does have a kind of a melancholic vibe, which is fine. I like a bit of tonal navel gazing. The track Sad Skinhead is a fascinating uh, uh, one on this, described by Deep Cuts as a kitsch skank guitar piece. It has a certain twee German vibe to it. There's even glockenspiel there as well. This album is very different from the banana smoking, acid dropping, uh, nudist colony type uh, vibe going on with Amandol, uh, a band that I think are absolutely remarkable by the way. This music has an almost uh, industrial feel to it, rather than the, the sprawling psychedelia of the former. For me Faust's records feel much more grounded, and despite Can being much well known, this band is seen as the archetypal kraut rock band and released four records in the space of, I think, two years. Absolutely intriguing music from the droning 12-minute opener, Kraut Rock, as I've said, to, to uh, I think, the last track, Just the Second. I don't know if I've got that right. But it's now that bristles with creative intent. And as I said, you get tracks like Sad Skinhead and Jennifer, which both point to the pop market, albeit in a kind of an ironic parody of what uh, pop success looks like no doubt viewed from the fringes of the outer barn. Number nine is Cluster 2 by Cluster from 1972. This extraordinary band were formed in 1969 and their music seems to pulse to the very rhythms of life. The main man behind this band was a chap named Hans Rokim Rodelius. Uh, I hope I've said his name right, but this chap was um, a member of the Hitler Youth when he was a boy, so he draws upon a lot of very intriguing shades for this music. This band was definitely a stepping stone, what can only be described as a ambient electronica. It's a very embodiment of what cosmic music was set out to do. At times it feels almost otherworldly as it 
breaks from the conventions of Western music, skillfully employing such gadgetry as uh, synths and tone generators, all melded with you know, electric guitars and cello, believe it or not. Overall, they create a sonic experience which haunts the listener long after the needle has left the groove. The opening track is fraught and threatens to shatter at any minute. Not to mention the, um, the track Living De Fabric, an epic piece that explores lots of sonic motifs. It's an incredibly atmospheric record, very pulsating uh, feel to it. I personally find there's a lot of joy to be had listening to this music, strange as that may sound. Number eight is UFO by Guru Guru from 1970. This is a potent double dose of acid rock from the eerie rumblings that start this album to its very title, which suggests we're in for some intergalactic orbiting around the astral plane, no doubt with Timothy Leary. This band are perhaps one of the more predictable bands on my list, given my predilection for this uh, trippy psychedelic shit. There's even a track on this album called The LSD Marsh or The LSD March, which has us all tripping along nicely. I've always said American psychedelia is the real deal, but my word, this, uh, this album provides us uh, with a pretty intense listening experience. This band tumble through what feels like an improvised foray, uh, that is a lysergic jamboree of feedback, clatter and guitar screeches. If you enjoy the more experimental, spacey and avant-garde noodlings of early Floyd, then I suspect this album is going to be right up your bubblegum tree. Guru Guru were a bunch of uh, jazz musicians who were um, effectively and convincingly, I have to say, seduced by the 1960s counterculture. This album is experimental, it is interpretive, it's uh, improvisational psychedelic texturing. UFO is their debut album and it voyages into the far reaches of the cerebral cosmos. Number seven is Lucifer's Friend by Lucifer's Friend from 1970. Um, an absolutely intriguing band really. Some of you are surprised I perhaps haven't gone for their second album uh, when the groupies killed the blues. I think that's what it's called if my memory serves me right. Uh, simply because it's an album that employs a lot of uh, psychedelic textures which is um, right up my street as, as well you know. Also, their, their fourth album, I believe, Banquet, is an important one as well. It's in a, as an interesting work of fusion. Um, but no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with this one, where it all begins. And of course, this album begins with that scream that opens Ride the Sky, before we get that tortured trumpeting sound, which um, sounds like somebody buggering an elephant on the periphery. This song does actually bear some resemblance to Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song, minus the elephant, of course. Lucifer's Friend is a gorgeously heavy band that have seemed to have ripped a page straight out of uh, the Deep Purple Mark II songbook. A band that also cited it as an influence in terms of the burgeoning doom metal scene as well. I love um, what, what sounds like improvised jamming on this record as well as that heavy Hammond uh, sound throughout. Which is why I love, uh, why I love you right heap so much. You know, but it's packed full of strong riffs. Very much like purple to keep that uh, illusion going with lots of uh, rubbery bass lines and uh, uh, excellent keyboard work but the one can also draw comparisons with early sabbath as well with the uh, atmosphere and gloominess but despite their name they weren't all about the worship of the dark one i think there's one track on this album that uh, very much focuses on uh, demonic demonic visitation sorry um, which you know, has something in common of course with that uh, eponymous sabbath track from their debut album. There's lots of stuff on this record that suggests a potentially conceptual thread, shall we say, which is never quite picked up by the band. Fascinating number which has some biblical resonances called, you know, in the time of Job when Mammon was a yippie. It has lyrics like, uh, screw me, I'm a tuber, free as a beanstalk. Well, that's good to know. Um, I suspect there's uh, perhaps a proliferation of psychedelics here or maybe just a dodgy grasp of English. Overall, Lucifer's Friend is an intriguing proto-metal album. If you like your music dark and heavy, I think you'll enjoy this. Um, an album, a band that are also incredibly influential in terms of the goth movement uh, as well. Number six is Noi, the debut album from 1972. This band are splintering off from craft work, uh, but nevertheless produced an incredibly influential record, certainly one that struck a chord with Iggy Pop, who was um, particularly struck with the repetitious rhythms of this record. Crikey, you try saying that. In fact, it goes on to describe the music on this record as pastoral psychedelia. 
The whole thing is um, a kind of an Eastern vibe to it. It's like a strange melding between Ravi Shankar and Hawkwind. These strange rhythms and textures and the guitars just chime away. It's absolutely uh, exquisite to listen to. I sometimes find this music has, um, for me, almost has a timelessness or timeless quality. It's like those summers when you're a child that just uh, you just lose yourself in. Now, there's a myth to live by. Also, the, the motoric beat is, is very prominent on this album, especially the track Negative Land, which goes on for about 10 minutes and feels like some sort of conceptual representation of a journey into space. We've got this whole garage band vibe going on here, and, and especially with those uh, drum patterns, the whole thing seems a little bit unearthly. Lots of strange bleeps and whooshes and those Teutonic drones and feedback all wrapped around this very loose and plodding bass line. I find the whole thing absolutely fascinating. It just meanders along like some strange prog tributary, um, which is a, a quite an interesting simile, actually, considering um, uh, Michael Rother, if I've said his name right, has spoken of water or the perception of water as being a predominant influence on this band's writing. This first album feels very ambient, which is um, a little bit different from their second album, which uh, is certainly more metallic. Number five is Popol Vu Hosiana Mantra from 1972. It's an album that you can just float away on like a pillow of wind, in fact. Um, these wonderful, beautiful concert hall sounding piano. Reminds me a little bit of the Rick Wright uh, part on uh, Pink Floyd's Alma Gunner. It's an intriguing melding of East and Western styles of music. Um, but this album is very much about the journey, the journey that begins as soon as the needle hits the vinyl, so to speak. Music Express described this as one of the most beautiful records ever made. And what is explored is Florian Frick's new fascination with Christianity and Buddhism, which forms the, the basis of this record, hence the title Hosanna and Mantra. It's very different from the Moog-driven music of the first two records. It's a remarkable explosion that soars, of course, aided by the use of wonderful use of voice and uh, acoustic instruments as well as some electric guitar flourishes a very Gilmore-esque ethereal guitar motifs throughout. It all creates a, a gorgeous topography of sound. Frick's piano, uh, Connie Veidt's guitar as well as tracks with oboe and tambora all lend um, a, a certain evocative power to this music. It's a work of unique ambient psychedelic prog fusion. It sends a listener off on this sort of meditative drift like prog nirvana. I believe this record was partly inspired by the dialogical existentialism of Martin Buber, the Austrian philosopher, and the belief that all religions are essentially the same. This album feels like, very much feels like a meditative prayer. The only comparable record I have to this is the Electric Prunes uh, Mass in F minor. Number four is Kraftwerk and Autobahn from 1974, or Autobahn if you're going to use your uh, very plummy home counties accent, but. Uh, I think the German pronunciation is more alto, alto barn. There's no doubt this is a groundbreaking album with that hypnotic pulse, that incessant propulsive throb. Um, you know, and those repeated rhythms and riffs, it has that futuristic shimmer that beguiled a whole legion of bands that uh, assaulted the charts in the early 80s. And the keyboard work on this is predictably icy, I have to say. Um, beautifully complemented with the trance-like guitars. In fact, the title track runs on for about, I think, about 22 minutes. It's uh, quite an opus. This richly textured soup, if you like, single-handedly demonstrates why this band is so important. On this record, as one critic has already pointed out, you can detect the foundations of electro-funk ambient and synth pop, which spreads out and exercises a stranglehold over the, the UK's top 40 for the next 10, 15 years or so. There's lots of nice touches, atmospheric touches on this record. Uh, things like the use of sounds and the slamming of car doors, the engine and the whoosh, which is a sonic and metaphorical reference to the rushing of traffic. The lyrics do allude subtly to something being beyond the sprawl of the motorway. There are some a uh, hint or two of the presence of the sun's glittering rays and the green verges. I often wonder if Jack in the Green is going to spring up. And there are four intriguing instrumentals that uh, one, crit one critic has pointed out represents a counterbalance to the harsh industrial daylight of Autobahn. As a listener, if we were taken on a journey from those nighttime flashes to the midnight ghostly textures, and finally we are serenaded by flutes and acoustic instrumentation as we take a morning stroll. A strange and remarkable piece, there's no doubt of that. Number three is Grobschnitt from 1972, the debut album, I believe. 
right from the first Teutonic Wagnerian warbling at the beginning to the end of this record, uh, the listener is in for quite a quite a ride, it has to be said. Interesting, they're rather uh, strange elements of their music would often spill over into their live show, making it uh, quite a spectacle. I must admit, I'd love a copy of this album, but I don't think it's actually available anymore. Uh, I have to contend myself, unfortunately, with just a YouTube download. Symphony opens this record, which is an absolutely exquisite piece. It sounds like uh, Wagner meets uh, Vanilla Fudge. What a great combination, especially, you know, around about uh, 1 minute 38 when the whole thing shifts up a gear. Incredible guitar work that has the, has the whiff of early Santana to it. One critic has described their music as subdued zaniness. Uh, but I don't think there's anything particularly subdued or zany about it. It's just great, great prog. Lovely Hammond sound on this as well as the vocals. It's like Chris Farlow meets Van de Graaff Generator. The musical interplay and dynamic range is absolutely superb. Side 2 is almost a sidelong suite. My word, we certainly like those, don't we? It's called Sun Trip. Fascinating sonic exploration that fluctuates between moments of wonderful organ parts and heavy guitar work. It's not so riff heavy in the way like Uriah Heat might have been. It's more improvisational, more cinematic in its scope. I must have absolutely love this record. I would urge you to give it a listen. Number two is Amandul 2 Yeti from 1972. Not to be confused with the original Amandul that with this communal acid dropping um, psych prog um, freeform, meandering, whatever you want to call it, but certainly Amandul too were better musicians, I, I think. Um, I love the meandering vibe and mood of the music with this band, and especially on this album. It, there's a lot of improvisational stuff going on there as well, still, I think, carrying on from the, the spirit of the original Amandul. Uh, it meanders with a sense of what one can only describe as almost a sense of psychedelic abandon. In fact, Frank Zappa went on to say, if they were a bit more structured, uh, more organised, it'd be one of the biggest bands in the world. But as you've already guessed, I really love the vague, trippy formlessness of this sort of music. It's infused with these heavy sustained guitars and punctuated by these very dramatic percussive flourishes, which, you know, make it intriguing listening uh, for me. The music sounds raw and ephemeral, full of these rapid and random chord progressions, which are... Uh, uh, interesting to say the least. I think the mood that really describes this band's music is a kind of primal primitivism, uh, which very much defines the, the vibe explored on this album, as, in, as indeed it did on the first one. Um, what was it called? Uh, Phallus Day, or God's Penis, if you like. This album has been described by Ultimate Classic Rock as an uh, unfettered experimentation with style and form that makes Pink Floyd's Amagama feel like an exercise in brevity and discipline. I just love the trippy feel of this music. It really floats my boat, albeit down uh, rivers under tangerine skies and something like that. And It's heady, untamed, trance-inducing stuff. It's certainly heavier and hairier than the first album. Interestingly, Lester Bangs describes this band as Germany's great psych overlord band. One can certainly detect the influence of psychedelia of bands like Frank Zappa and the Mothers. Uh, certainly apparent on here, the avant-garde is uh, also uh, an influence. But I love the mood of this music and the form of their formlessness. Interestingly, I read somewhere that uh, Amandul 2 were the first cosmic band to be signed to an international label. Number one, and I'm sure you've guessed it, is Targo Margo by Can from 1971. This album is a compelling and disturbing listen, it really is. It's a funky, nightmarish, uh, psychedelic foray. It's, uh, for, in my opinion, it's very much the cherry on the cake in terms of this whole genre. The drumming and the bass on this album is something else, some exquisite... Uh, uh, percussive uh, flourishes here that certainly add colour to these um, to these extended um, extended pieces. We get tribal drums, tom toms, even a cowbell. In my opinion, much of the brilliance of these arrangements can be traced back to the influence of um, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, under which both uh, Erman Schmidt and Holger Suke both studied. And of course, we get uh, Damo Suzuki on vocals and his smacked out drawl. You know, it just gives me the munchies listening to it. There's no doubt that the highlight on this album is the 18 minute Hallelujah. It's time well spent as we're drawn into this funky, far out groove. You know, I love the calmness that descends at the end of this record with the track, uh, you know, Bring Me Coffee and Tea. It's certainly an interesting juxtaposition after the sonic chaos that precedes it. 
Many have described the music on this album as having a terrifying edge that immerses the listener in this paranoid miasma. I feel like there's a similarity between this and uh, some of Radiohead's later material. The importance of this album cannot be understated. It penetrates balls deep into the into Western popular and experimental music. We're just seduced by its slow groove and its uh, ambient dreamscapes. And there's bands like The Fall and the aforementioned Radiohead that owe a, a debt, I think, to, to this album and this band. Even John Lydon has cited this as an early influence which has announced itself on those uh, uh, Public Image Limited records. In fact, he said this band uh, defies categorization. The only way to categorize this band is alphabetically. One critic has said with this record that we can see flicks of the future set against the backdrop of the past. This album is a dark, twisted, funk-infused melee of sound. Interesting anecdote for you. The actor David Niven saw this band play live in, uh, I think it was a nightclub in Munich. And some of the band members went up to him afterwards and asked him what he thought about the music. His response was uh, remarkable. He said, uh, I thought it was wonderful. I just didn't realise it was music. Anyway, there you go. That's my 10 favourite Cosmish music albums. You can attack me in the in the boxes below for all the emissions, uh, things I've left out. Anyway, I'll just, uh, if you've managed to watch this video so far without switching off, I certainly thank you for doing that. And uh, as always, I urge you to click like, subscribe and share this video, please. So I'll just leave you by saying I hope you're all uh, staying warm and staying safe, but more importantly that you keep listening.